Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Tom Watson, let's get stuck straight into this. I'm going to open the phone lines now because it's a, it's a contemplation that we'll undertake together. If you haven't been listening to the programme a lot over the last few months, we, we've done, I think, more than anyone else in covering this story. Um, the Lord Janna uh, accusations, the uh, Cyril Smith uh, posthumous revelations, uh, all, all of the so-called establishment cover-up and the so-called VIP child abuse scandal. We've stared and stared and stared and stared at this story in the hope of achieving some form of clarity and we haven't yet, although I'm not going to lie to you, I, I need no encouragement or persuasion whatsoever to believe that there is um, uh, definitely more to it than meets the eye. There might be a little bit more smoke than fire and it may be it may transpire that some of the names that have emerged into the public arena didn't really deserve to be there, but I, I just feel this morning deeply uncomfortable at the turn that's been taken overnight since that Panorama programme earlier in the week, which poo-pooed a lot of the allegations that have been made and discredited many of the witnesses. You heard Mark Watts of XRO News tell me on... Uh, uh, the, the morning after that program was broadcast that one of the survivors of child sex abuse that has been working with that organization had been hospitalized following a suicide attempt there are obviously ramifications and repercussions involved in these sort of stories and these sort of accusations that are pretty close to limitless so what do we know well, we know, and this is where I'm uncomfortable with the way things have turned this morning, that Tom Watson, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, is very much in the firing line today. Watson under fire is the headline in The Times for abuse claims. I, I'm not a big subscriber to massive conspiracy theories and the notion of puppet masters slowly sort of um, t turning us into drones who will do their will, but I do think it's almost impossible for Tom Watson to get a fair treatment in any way from the British press because he made so many enemies by leading the line on the hacking scandal. It was Tom Watson's work, tireless work on this issue. He's by no means a perfect individual. The fact that he grew up on the same street as me in Kidderminster will not impart any form of rose-tinted spectacles to me, but I don't see how he can expect to get treated fairly by the massive majority of the British press. There's a relish, there's a glee being displayed by some of the columnists today, either currently or previously in the pay of Rupert Murdoch, um, but still very much part of his fan club. And they are combining today to, to portray him as, um, you know, they've given him nicknames referring to his weight and all, all, all that sort of thing and, and sort of catchy little pithy phrases that appear to trivialise, appear to me to trivialise child sex abuse and almost subscribe to the notion that if you're really, really important, you can expect to live by different rules from everywhere else. So I could be wrong. It's the first thing you can pick a hole in if you want. It's eight after ten. The idea that Tom Watson somehow can't get fair treatment from the British press. But it's not just the press, of course. Other politicians are queuing up. Indeed, a former director of public prosecutions added his voice this morning to calls for Tom Watson to apologise to the family of the late Leon Britton. What for? Well, in 2014, and some journalists have seen this letter, I haven't, but I know the details contained within it, Tom Watson wrote to the Director of Public Prosecutions, Alison Saunders, and he demanded, and I quote now, a full review into claims of rape and sexual abuse. It was a very strongly worded letter. It demanded, effectively, that the Metropolitan Police reopen an investigation into claims by a female victim called Jane that she had been raped by Leon Britton in 1967. Tom Watson urged Alison Saunders to call the politician in for questioning. He was, at the time, dying of cancer. And this is going to sound brutal, but I don't think that's relevant to this story. I really don't think that's relevant to this story. I can see why Lord Janna's dementia is relevant to his story, but I don't see why Lord, Lord, Lord Britain's cancer would be relevant to this story. You could, again, correct me on that if you so wish. So they were urged also to review, and I quote once more, the entire historic caseload of allegations against Lord Britain, of which there were many. He referred specifically in this letter to two further cases, citing, and in, in the letter he included the real names of the alleged victims. Those names have not and must not reach the public arena. But one of them was the gentleman known by the pseudonym David, who told Panorama this week that he'd been encouraged in a way to make the allegation by campaigners by anti-paedophile campaigners and now felt a degree of guilt that he had done so. Isn't it strange with these sort of stories that when an apparently vulnerable witness says something that suits your agenda, 
um, he's not vulnerable or unreliable anymore. But when he says something that doesn't suit your agenda, he's desperately vulnerable and unreliable. So we have to believe as absolute gospel David's latest comments about guilt and being encouraged to do this, but we shouldn't believe at all anything that he said previously, unless, of course, you're on the side of the um, almost perhaps too credulous belief in these allegations, in which case everything he said previously must be trusted completely and what he says now can't be. You see what I mean? I'm not going mad, am I? That's weird. If the words of an apparently vulnerable witness suit your agenda, you trust them. If they don't, you don't trust them. And that changes according to where your agenda is at any given time. It's bizarre. Bizarre, bizarre, bizarre. So, where are we? Those are the details. Those were the two names contained within the letter that the DPP received from the politician. He was questioned, Lord Britton, by detectives. He was terminally ill with cancer. Again, it's repeated in the story that I'm referring to here. It's been reported that there were several inconsistencies in, in Jane's evidence, but the accusation was bona fide. She had made it. And the Met has since informed Britain's widow that they've abandoned that investigation. It's currently unclear what action police have taken in the two other cases. So you could, I think, make an argument for saying that they were still investigating or that, that case, those cases had not been closed. Lord Britain's widow has been told that he was not um, considered to have any case to answer with regard to the accusation of rape from 1967, but the other two cases, the, the accusations of child sex abuse, it's unclear what action police have taken. So to claim that all accusations have been dismissed or have fallen apart would be wrong. Nevertheless, Tom Watson, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, faces renewed calls for him to apologise to Lord Britain's family. Leon Britain's brother was uh, giving interviews this morning, himself a journalist, accusing police of outrageous treatment of his brother. He gave an interview to ITV News in which he said that allegations made against his brother were either somebody fishing or mistaken identity. I don't see that he has legal grounds to make that statement, actually, not, not, not as a conclusion, as an observation or an opinion, but not as a matter of fact. Uh, one of Leon Britain's friends, Lord Lester of Herne Hill, former Liberal Democrat peer, has written to the Times today and called on Tom Watson to apologise. He accuses him of having, and I quote again, mounted what I believe to be a sustained, cowardly attack on my old friend, Leon Britton. So there you have it. You now know as much about this story as anybody else in the country does. What's Tom Watson done wrong? 03456060973. He received information which contained allegations made against Lord Britain as long ago as 1967, and he wanted to know why the case hadn't been pursued further. We know that in 1967, certain allegations against certain members of certain social classes in this country were probably not investigated with the rigour that they would be today. We know that the pendulum has swung, as it were, on the notion of impunity for VIPs when it comes to crimes. What has Tom Watson done wrong? I'm going to be a very, very, very lonely voice in the British media asking that question. He's already been um, convicted and indeed sentenced by most of the newspapers and most of the commentators. And maybe by the end of this hour, we'll join in that condemnation. But at the moment, if you receive, if someone told you that I had abused children, would you just sit on the information yourself? Would you just keep it quiet? If you considered the witnesses to be at least worth listening to. By no means could he have stated categorically that he believed them. He said he found them sincere and he found them credible. OK, well, if someone that you found sincere and credible told you that I was a child abuser, where would you go with the information? What would you do with the information? What would you expect any responsible, decent, upstanding citizen to do with that information? I'm scared this morning because it seems to me that those weird men who we've never properly understood, but who seem to think that investigating these sort of allegations is, is wrong or um, somehow unnecessary, you know, these lines about Jimmy Savile is still dead, as if somehow taking seriously the testimony of people who in some cases have taken decades to come forward oh, it's all a waste of time, should pull themselves together, they should get over it. That kind of attitude. I find it deeply, deeply sinister. And it seems to be winning today. And Leon Britton's case seems to be the story that's made them think they've got the whip hand. Uh, conveniently forgetting the fact that many of the allegations levelled at so-called VIPs have turned out to be true. He hasn't been cleared. They've just decided not to pursue the case. I think you can only really get cleared in a court of law, but he was told that, or rather his widow was told, that they wouldn't be pursuing the allegations any further. In the case of that one 
accusation. There's two other people who have made allegations against him. And yet, if you looked across the newspapers today, television coverage, some of the radio you may have heard, it would seem that tanks are gathering on the lawn. And I don't quite understand why. So you tell me what Tom Watson has done wrong. And you are perfectly entitled to answer that question with the word nothing. Nothing at all. He received information. He found it credible. He found it sincere. He took it to the authorities. The authorities responded. But because it's a former Conservative cabinet minister, some people in this country think that that shouldn't have happened. But I don't remember the last time they got their collective knickers in such a twist about a false accusation being levelled at a less, shall we say, esteemed individual. So what has Tom Watson done wrong? 0345 6060973 is the number to call. We've been warning for weeks that a backlash would begin. It's begun now, and Tom Watson's first in the firing line. Do you understand why? Can you explain to me, and I, as ever on this programme, will happily step back from the stridency of my current position if you give me what I need to do so. Can you tell me why he is getting such a kicking today? for acting in a way that I would hope we all would have the courage to do if we found credible and sincere allegations of this sort of crime. I can't help wondering whether the country is being encouraged to crawl back to a time when abused children were expected to stay silent, even decades after the crimes had been committed. I don't know what Leon Britton did or did not do, but I know that when people come forward with accusations, it's up to us how we treat them. What do you think? 0345 6060 is the number you need. Should Tom Watson apologise? 0345 6060 And if so, what for? Very briefly, before we hit the travel news, the other side of this, of course, is that let us imagine for a moment, and it may not be a case of imagining, it may be the truth, let us imagine for a moment that Leon Britton is absolutely innocent of every single allegation and accusation brought against him. In which case, I very cautiously, because if it was me or my dad or someone I cared for, I'm sure I'd struggle to sustain this position. But the price you pay for treating the accusers properly is sometimes names end up in the public arena unfairly. And if that name happens to be Leon Britton's, I don't understand why he's getting treated so differently from how he would be if he was a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or an ordinary member of society with no links to the so-called establishment. Maybe I'm going mad. Maybe I'm seeing things that aren't there. Maybe I'm believing in fairies. But you need to help me understand what it is in what I've just explained to you that is wrong. What is Tom Watson supposed to apologise for today? 0345 6060 973. And what do you think is going on? Phone lines are open. You can say what you want today. It's your show, not mine. Watson under fire for abuse claims. Now say sorry, Mr Watson. That's the Times and the Mail, the pincer movement, if you will, of the right-wing media in this country. Explain yourself over Leon Britton, Boris warns police chief. You could, I think, construe this as an example of the establishment gathering forces, and they've got Tom Watson particularly in their sights. Do you understand completely why? 0345 6060 is the number that you need. What exactly is Tom Watson being ordered by Rupert Murdoch and various other members of the media and the upper echelons of the right-wing political class? What is he being ordered to apologise for? He didn't tell a lie. He didn't deliberately do something wrong. If it is the case that Leon Britton had no involvement whatsoever in anything unpleasant or illegal, then, well... That's the price you pay for taking allegations seriously. It wouldn't be an easy thing to say if it was you getting maligned. It wouldn't be an easy thing to say if it was your dead father being libelled and, and, and <sighs> disgraced in this way. But what is the alternative? When someone comes forward with an accusation, what is the alternative? 0345 6060 973. Michael's in Cardiff. Michael, what would you like to say? Well, I, I'd like to say I think you're missing the point, um, actually, James. Wouldn't be the first time, Michael. Fine. No, maybe not. Well, moral outrage is fine, and I, but I think yours today is probably misdirected, even though it's worthy. But the point is, details emerged of a letter that Mr. Watson wrote to the Director of Public Prosecution, and that's where I have a major problem. One, that letter just emerged long after it was written. When MPs start to influence the Director of Public Prosecution, it can go both ways. What happens if Mr. Watson didn't like the fact that the DPP were going to arrest somebody or take a case, and then he used his influence to stop them doing it. 
the point is... No, 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 you can't, you can't, no, no, you can't have that. You, you can't say he shouldn't Why? have done the right thing because he might have done the wrong thing. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, they're not mutually exclusive. What I'm saying well, is... That's exactly what you just said. Well, what if he tried to stop an investigation instead of trying to start one? That, that is a ludicrous comparison. That's like saying, what if he tried to start a fire instead of trying to blow one out? Well, no, James, yes. do you think MPs... No, do you think, James, MPs, not, nothing to do with their own constituents, should be writing to the Director of Public Prosecution... I think they have as much right to do so as you do and I do, yes. That's why I kept asking what you would do if someone told you I was abusing children. Someone came to you and said, James O'Brien abused me 30 years ago. What would you do with the information? No, no, forget, forget the case. It's all just about an MP using influence to, for the GPP. When did you last... When did we last hear that, J James? Seriously. Well, it, it, he's like got as much... You asked me a question, I've answered it. Well, why should he have less right to write to the DPP than you do? OK. Um, could you answer my question? No, I just when, did. When... when I don't, I don't know the details of the secret correspondence that the DPP receives from any members of the public. Why would an MP be different? Do you, do you think MPs should be writing to the DPP? I think we all should, if we receive it. If we genuinely believe that investigations into crimes as heinous as these are not being properly undertaken, why wouldn't you write to the DPP? OK, fine. Why wouldn't you write? If you, if you thought that some children had been abused by a senior politician and that it hadn't been properly investigated, just explain to me why you personally wouldn't write to the DPP. Well, the DPP is independent, and they should not be, they should not, they should, are they not professional enough to make their own decisions? It's not a trick question. You, you've got information that you believe to be credible and sincere. It involves the abuse of young children. I want you to tell me why you wouldn't take that to the authorities, in this case, the Director of Public Prosecutions. Well, I'd take it to the police. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use my influence to take it to the DPP. You wouldn't have any influence. You'd, ju you'd just be asking uh, for, for a response to information received. No, I, 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 I don't think it's the place of any MP to write... Well, then I'll go back to my original question, which is why should they have less right to do that than you? Well, they don't have less right than well, me. Well, then we're agreed. We'd all do what he did in the circumstances. Well, he, he, he probably wrote on House of Commons notepaper and, and he... Oh, my goodness. So if he's used Basildon Bond, it would have been all right. You, James... Michael. He's used this position. He's used this position. She, if, if, if I wrote... What the hell do we want our MPs to use their position for if not to ensure that allegations of child sex abuse undertaken by people at the top of the parliamentary ladder have actually been properly investigated? What should an MP use his position for if not that, Michael? Go to the police, not to the DPP. Well, the police are getting a kicking as well. Boris Johnson apparently is calling for Bernard Hogan Howe's blood because the investigation was undertaken in the way that it was. So you go to the police, you end up seeing your career being threatened, you go to the DPP and Michael in Cardiff thinks you're a wrong one. What, what, where should they have gone? Uh, I said the police. OK, well, I'm telling you that Bernard Hogan Howe is apparently under fire from Boris Johnson for the way the investigation has unfolded. Another senior Conservative. I'm not making any links. I'm just saying if it was you, Michael, that had been accused of these things and you were innocent, I don't think you'd be getting the fuss that we're seeing here. I hate this story. Frightens the life out of me. 27 minutes after 10. I almost want it all not to be true. I almost want it all to go away. Because as we've said before, you're staring into the abyss. Comments like Michael's well-meaning, informed, intelligent, educated comments like that sound like, oh, no. Oh, no, MPs shouldn't be getting involved in that sort of thing. Oh, no. Well, what the hell else should they be doing? What has Tom Watson got to apologise for? 03456060973. Answer, traducing the reputation of a dead cabinet minister. Except he didn't, did he? He didn't traduce the rep. That involves a deliberate deceit. That involves a libel, uh, an untruth. He merely reported allegations. And I want to live in a country where children, when they've grown up, who make these allegations get taken seriously. Where we seem to be heading now, where the debate seems to be going is to a suggestion that you can take these sort of people too seriously. Some of them won't be telling the truth. That is the nature of humanity, not the nature of survivors or victims. It's the nature of humanity that some of them won't be telling the truth. Okay? So how have we allowed this situation to turn, it would appear to me from the front of the Mail and the Times today, to turn into a question that's ever so slightly sleazy, being put forward by ever so slightly sleazy columnists. Do you think maybe these sort of damaged people, some of whom have, obviously, I have to say at this point, some of whom have endured horrible crimes committed against them, and I read these people, I read these men, and what I hear, what I see between the lines is this, I think we take these accusers too seriously. 
these people making allegations, especially when it's against highly important people like Leon Britton or Jimmy Savile or Cyril Smith, I think we're taking them too seriously. I think the do-gooding liberals have gone too far on this. They've started listening to everybody who accuses somebody of having abused them when they were a child. These do-gooding lefties, they've actually started taking every child seriously when they find the courage to come forward with an allegation. And if we can just find a couple whose allegations weren't true, then we can use them to denigrate and undermine and dismiss all of the ones whose allegations are true. And you look me in the eye now and tell me why the hell anybody, anybody in this country would want to dismiss or denigrate or dilute the allegations of children who have suffered abuse. Why would anybody want people coming forward to be a little less courageous, a little less encouraged, a little less convinced that they will finally, after decades of suffering in silence, be taken seriously? Why would anybody want a real-life victim to be a little less likely today to come forward and tell the truth? And what exactly is it that Tom Watson is supposed to be apologising for? James O'Brien, weekdays 10 till 1 on LBC. 25 minutes to 11 is the time. I always get a little bit unnerved when uh, I feel pennies dropping while I'm actually talking or listening to you on this programme. But what it looks like to me today that Tom Watson finds himself at the centre of is an almost gleeful uh, belief that some of the people who alleged to uh, abuse by Leon Britton um, are not credible. That seems to be what people have leapt upon. Uh, including the Panorama program in which one of his accusers um, uh, revealed that he'd been sort of encouraged, even uh, not coerced, but encouraged to identify Leon Britton. And they've leapt upon it with such glee. That's where I was this morning. Why, why the glee? Because if you can find any flaws, if you can find any holes, if you can find any inaccuracies in any of the accusers, you can use it to discredit all of them. Now, you look me in the eye now and tell me that doesn't stink. Or, actually, I'd be grateful if you could look me in the eye and tell me that I've got it wrong. It doesn't look like that at all, James. Chill out, mate. 0345 6060973. Avril's in Borehamwood. Avril, what would you like to say? Well, you more or less just said... I mean, I, I really... This does make me so angry, this, because if, I do feel it's like the Emperor's New Clothes, that we are all... Sort of, we all know that, well, I feel that a lot of my friends and my family feel the same as me, that there's something going on you can't quite put your finger on. We're all led to sort of, like, believe that... I mean, the, the ruling classes, the MPs and that, they have acted in a way all these years almost with impunity. They make us, they make us believe that all this sort of stuff, leave it to us, you know, we know what we're doing, um, you know. And Tom Watson has stuck his head out and put his neck on the line and made us sort of feel that... You know, they can be questioned. But, but what can. if he's? But he might. He might. He could well be wrong. Of everything you just said, could be true. But Tom Watson could have been wrong about. Or these witnesses, these these survivors, these these accusers, could be wrong. Some some of them could be. Some of them could not be. I mean, within you, you know, you, 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 there there might well be the, the case that a couple of these people, you know, what they're saying is completely inaccurate and didn't happen. Let's say the worst case scenario, and there's just a fantasy, couple of fantasies they've completely made, for whatever reason, they've made this up. Well, what's happening now is that the, they are desperate to lynch on, to get, get one of these people disproved, to find out that this is inaccurate. And then it's, this is it. This is what happens when you don't leave it to us. You have to trust it, leave it to We know what we're doing. This is what they want us to believe. They are trying so hard to discredit just one of these people. Just and uh, well, it, it, and do. it's it's and because these people are anonymous and and vulnerable, they, that Tom Watson becomes the target. Tom, and of course, Tom Watson has very few friends on Fleet Street because he had the audacity to shine a light into some of my profession's darkest corners. You can see the relish with which people like Kelvin McKenzie and Richard Littlejohn are going for him today. And you don't really need to be Sherlock Holmes to work out that it's not just about this story. He has become the the, the lever. If it turns out that these witnesses, these accusers are, are wrong, are, are, are mistaken, are vulnerable, are, are being dishonest, then Watson's going to get thrown to the wolves and it will be used as an attempt to effectively say we can't, we can't carry on treating all these people so seriously and so respectfully. 
I think it would have he would have received this sort of this poison, this sort of campaign against him. I mean, you know, obviously with, with what's gone on before, um, he's like like you've said, like you pointed out, he really isn't anyone's sort of. You know, there's a lot of people that are gunning for him. But I think the fact, be it over um, child sex abuse, be it over expenses, be it over the phone hacking, whatever it was, if you are to stand up amongst your peers where there's, there's almost like this culture of, you know, that they are the ruling classes, they are above us, they are this little elite group, you know, and, and one of them, one of their own, has stood up and said, hang on a minute, you know, hang on, let's listen to this, let's, you know, one of them has done that. He, he's seen really as, as the, the complete black sheep. You know, Do you know, yeah. you, as you, it occurs to me as you speak that if you wrote a letter to the Times about this, you'd have no guarantee whatsoever that it got published, and you certainly wouldn't make a news story um, on, on page six of the newspaper referring readers to page 32 where they can read your letter. But if you are a member of the House of Lords, even as a mere Liberal Democrat peer, and if you are an old friend of Leon Britton's, not only does your letter get immediately published, but they stick it at the bottom of the news story on page six to tell readers as if he is somehow more important than the rest of us, as if his opinion is somehow more powerful, more, more relevant than everybody else in the country. I have phone lines, OK? I only have one free at the moment, the one that Avril's just vacated. I do not want to have an uninterrupted avalanche of agreement. If, if you can tell me what you think Tom Watson should be apologising for, I, I will take your call as quickly as I humanly can, OK? 0345 6060973, because the way I see this... What is he supposed to apologise for? Acting in good faith upon the say-so of an accuser who turned out not to be credible. That's in the case of the 1967 rape. In the case of the child sex abuse, well, the police haven't actually revealed that those investigations are complete. They just haven't. It's 10.40. Fred's in Bexley. Fred, what would you like to say? Yeah, hello, James. What I'd like to say is, um, I don't know if you remember Christine Keeler, Back in the 60s. Well, I was only born in 1972, but I think most of us are aware of the Profumo affair. Uh, it's re relevant to this. It's because it helped bring a government down. But not only that, I remember going to, to, um, to the uh, court, and uh, he said, no, I had nothing to do with it, Profumo. And she said, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Now, that's gone down in history. So, I don't know. I mean... So you just you, you, you think there's a, there is a cause of precedent for politicians expecting not to be treated with the same sort of scrutiny and robustness that the rest of us are? You, you're absolutely... Well, you're right in that case. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that Leon Britton has been let off the hook. Let us imagine for a moment that he is completely, completely innocent and has seen his name brought into the arena. His name has not been brought into the arena by Tom Watson. Not, not actually when you think about it. His name has been brought into the arena by one woman and two men who claimed that he'd committed sex crimes against them. Now, what should happen to that information? Back to the anonymity until proven guilty line. Back to the, uh, the notion that you don't name somebody until you've got more reason to name them. But we know it can count on... Well, you'd need to borrow each other's hands to count all the cases that have been strengthened by the release of a name because more people have then come forward. And if Leon Britton is innocent, that is the price you pay sometimes for knowing that accusers will be treated correctly. Jeanette's in Margate. Jeanette, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, I just got so angry. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I just want to congratulate you, James O'Brien. You need to really stay strong for these people. And I just had to call on behalf of children that have been abused. You know, and I think I, I'm really talking to people who consider themselves to be good, who consider themselves to be adults. We need to look after these people. Even if it's not or an adult comes to you and tells you that they've been abused, even if they are lying, there's a reason. Now, let's put aside those who are lying, because I think you need to act as if you believe them and then find out, you know, tell them what the implications are. And let's focus on the ones that are telling the truth. There are only a few of them that even survive what they've been through to come to the point where they come and approach us. We need to respect that. Absolutely, um, Tom Watson did the right thing. And we all should do it. I can't believe anybody is actually questioning why he should do that. The only people that will question it are those who either don't believe all these children or the adults that have come through who really don't care. And they really should ask themselves, well, 
well, why are we reacting this way? Well, I, I need if a more chari- I need a more charitable. Now I have to come up with something more than that because at the moment I can't see further than you can. Uh, it seems to me that any motivation. I and mean, one columnist calls Tom Watson the nonce finder general, as if this is an opportunity. Child sex abuse allegations are an opportunity to coin witty nicknames. I, I, I want an explanation that doesn't sound like they just take child sex abuse less seriously than the rest of us do. Well, you need to, we need to understand that not everybody in this world is good. There are bad people. There are bad people who are of this mindset that child abuse is okay. We need to understand that. And some of these people will support that. And one thing that I've heard, because I've been listening, I love LBC, and I've been listening for a long time about child abuse. And there was somebody who was trying to explain that it's not just about the child abuse. He was actually trying to say that there was like a religious, like a culty, um, a cult side of it. And because nobody really understood, I think they just kind of, his voice kind of just went a bit down and, and the, the interviewer didn't really know what to go with that. But we need to appreciate that there are a lot of people in powerful places who abuse children because it's part of whichever group they're in. It's not even about a sexual thing. It's about, it's like, you know, we do hazing and things. Yes. There are some people who will do things who will, you know, in gangs, you have to kill somebody. It's all part of us being together. And a lot of these people belittle, belittle, belittle this sort of activity because they probably have friends that do that. They think it's quite right. There are lots of people who actually are paedophiles and think that they're the only ones to understand how children feel. How dare they? These sorts of people think they're the only ones who know how to love. How can you love a child that can't even give consent? So these are the mindsets of people you're doing. They don't care about that. And I've, I, asked you to, I asked you to give me a more charitable analysis of people who aren't taking it quite as seriously as I think they should no. be doing, and you've come back by telling me they might all, they're no. probably all paedophiles. Jeanette, just, no, pause, no, no. just pause for a minute and, and tell me what your interest in this is. Why, why do you know so much about it? Oh, well, first of all, I'm a doctor, but I've always um, sort of um, counselled people. I, I speak to lots of people. I'm, I don't know, I'm a sort of person like a Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> if I see, so I love to watch people. I love to study them. And if I see someone who's not really interacting with other people, I want to hear their story. So I've heard lots of stories from, from children, from adults that have been abused. I was almost abused, and God bless my family. They, they stepped in and they did the right thing, and they, they dealt with the person. But the key thing was that as soon as I said it to my mum, I think I didn't even know what it was at the time i think somebody abused me or wanted to and my mum just acted straight away my all my brothers my sisters got in there and that has had a great impact on my life and i've spoken to people who weren't um, believed you know even their parents were part of we need to yes i I thought you were going to say i thought you were going to say that because that that is i mean for people who don't listen to the program on a regular basis that's where i come from I, I, that's exactly what my interest in this is it, was, it started two years ago when a teacher at my old prep school was jailed after seven or eight of my former classmates found the courage to come forward and even in our own community so there was a little bit oh it was so long ago oh you know and the teacher involved was very popular and very uh, quotes cool and you look back on that and you think well oh, crikey it's taken them 30 years to come forward 30 years my old mates 30 years to come forward. Everyone who comes forward has to be treated seriously, respectfully. And all Tom Watson did was ask for a case to be reopened, remember? Not opened. James O'Brien, weekdays 10 till 1 on LBC. 10.50 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Andrew in Hearn Hill says it's an old adage, James. You know that you're getting close when they start attacking the messenger. And David Streatham writes, James, last year we were shaking our heads and asking, how could this have happened? And now this. That's how. Referring, of course, to the well-established cases that we know were, um, if you like, true. The Jimmy Savills, the Cyril Smiths. And, uh, of course, you've reminded me as well that it wasn't actually my prep school that prompted my interest in this story uh, exclusively. What went on in my own um, uh, school, uh, under our noses, a uh, man got away with it for years. It was that clip, wasn't it, that was dug out right at the beginning of all of this. Uh, that clip of a former Conservative whip. I'm going to play that to you in a minute as well. First, though, what is Tom Watson supposed to apologise for? Mark's in Ealing. Mark, what would you like to say? Morning, James. Uh, I don't, he's got nothing to apologise for, and I think that there was a lot of shaky, worried people uh, moving, you know, thinking, what is going to happen to this? What is there going to be uncovered? We're seeing, we're seeing uh, more coverage of a possible, uh, possibly un- undeserved accusation than we've seen of any of the deserved accusations. And we're living in a country where men were getting away with this sort of thing for years. And yet when one possible, possible accusation turns out 
maybe not to be true. I don't understand why friends and colleagues in the media are going mad about that and not about the ones that turned out to be true. Well, look at it this way, James. You look at the circles, all these people moving. They move in with the billionaire press owners. Uh, so they're all friends together. They all know each other by first name terms. And you, you notice that what's gone very, very quiet is the alleged paedophile ring within Parliament. And I've read more about Jeremy Corbyn in the short space of time that he has been in the media spotlight than I have about that uh, alleged paedophile ring within Parliament. And I just think that they're breathing a massive sigh of relief. And I don't think they should, because I think that something else will come up and it will reopen. But what they're doing is... They're well, here's, here's, what, the here's what I don't get. And, and in a way, I think you're tilting at the same windmill. I, I, what I don't get is this. <laughs> Nobody in a normal conversation would think that there were only two choices. You've got, you got hundreds of accusations being made, and you, here are your two choices, Britain. You either believe all of them or you believe none of them. And yet that, this morning, is where the debate is being pushed towards, where the story is being pushed towards. If we can find out, if we can prove or if we can find justification for believing that, that one of these accusers might not be telling the truth, we can use that to shut the lot of them up. And I don't get that. That stinks. I don't do conspiracy theories. I don't go as far as you do in talking about the establishment. I know some of the people you've just been referring to, and I might even be on first name terms with them, and I don't think they're involved in any of this, but I don't understand why the apparent possibility that, that, that some accusations were unfair and false can be turned so quickly and so violently into an attempt to dilute all accusers, all survivors, and all victims. And that's where I think your answers are more powerful than mine, Mark. Well, the thing is, what you've got to look at is that what I say is that not, all, not every one of them was involved, and that's what I mean on first name terms. But how many people since Jimmy Savile was uh, found out have turned around and said, "Yeah, it's common knowledge." Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. We all look, we all look the other way, and and you know, using it to inflame old prejudices on a political basis or even against the BBC or against certain journalists. I understand that. I get my head around that. That's logical. I don't like it, but it's there. What I can't quite understand is why the possibility that Leon Britton has been unfairly accused is being seized upon as proof that the whole thing, the whole thing, all of these people shouldn't be believed. Now, listen to this. The first time I played you this... We, we all did a collective double take. We all actually found ourselves going, because we live in a different age, OK? This was him speaking in 1995, but he was speaking of an era between 1970 and 1973. Anyone with any sense who was in trouble would come to the whips and, and tell them the truth. They'd say, no, this, I'm in a jam. Can you help? It might be debt. It, um, a scandal involving small boys or any kind of scandal. He's a chief whip for, for the then Conservative uh, leader, Edward Heath. Member His name was Tim Fortescue. Seemed likely and the first time I played lucky. you this, it wasn't just your jaws that hit the floor. It was mine as well. You could you, you could hear it in the studio. I'm going to play it to you again, against the backdrop of what they're doing to Tom Watson today. Anyone with any sense who was in trouble would come to the whips and, and tell them the truth. They'd say, no, this, I'm in a jam. Can you help? It might be debt. It might be um, a scandal involving small boys or any kind of scandal which... Um, the, a member seemed likely to be mixed up in, they'd come and ask if we could help. And if we could, we did. And we would do everything we can because we would store up brownie points. If, I mean, that sounds a pretty, pretty nasty reason, but it's one of the reasons, is if we can get a chap out of trouble, then he'll, he'll do as we ask for ever more. Just, just think about that for a minute. That is, that is not a lefty journalist or a crusading campaigner or a deputy leader of the Labour Party. That is a former Conservative whip 
talking about the abuse of little boys as if it was utterly unremarkable and routinely undertaken by the people he policed, i.e. Conservative MPs. Not confined to that party by any stretch of the imagination. Cyril Smith was a Liberal. Plenty of people on the, on the Labour benches who've been similarly uh, accused in recent years, some publicly, some not yet publicly. That is not somebody... That's not David Icke talking. That is Tim Fortescue, a whip in Ted Heath's office talking about the abuse of little boys as if it were as normal as fiddling your expenses or submitting a, uh, an inappropriate question to the party leader. I find that staggering. And if that was normal in the early 1970s, then the notion of it being plausible that Conservative MPs who did those crimes then are still alive now is absolutely irresistible. So if Leon Britton has been unfairly put into that category, that is a personal tragedy for him and his family. But the public interest is served by going after as many of those dirty old men as possible. And what the story today and the coverage today and the targeting of Watson looks like to me is an attempt to get them all off the hook. The ones Tim Fortescue was talking about, the ones a conservative whip identified right there. You heard it. What about them? How are they feeling today? I'll tell you how they're feeling. They're feeling bloody relieved. Alison's in Crawley. Alison, what would you like to say? I just question the timing of, of sort of Boris and, and what's it's like a horrible sort of establishment closing ranks situation <laughs> post the BBC panorama thing because... You know, we've known about this for a long time. Why is Boris ha come on? Oh, he's the new deputy. No, I, 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 it's probably my fault. I think you, you, you may have got your wires slightly crossed. I'm going to do something I have very rarely done in my life. I'm going to gall gallop to Boris Johnson's defence because he wants Bernard Hogan how to explain why they didn't tell um, Lord Britain's widow that he'd been cleared of a, or not cleared of a rape allegation, that they weren't looking any further into yeah. the rape allegation sooner. And I think there is a, that, that single question is fair enough. If it was you I or me... That, yeah, no, I agree. That is, that, is, that is entirely legitimate. It's nevertheless, in his language, most definitely trying to, you know, uh, make a big link, isn't he, to Tom Watson in all of this and the, and the timing of that. And I also think that Tom, uh, Tom Watson was not the first person to... Well, he wasn't the person anyway, but, I mean, Leon Britton was named in 1984 in Private Eye in relation to this. He was, but I, I, I suppose if I was if I was holding a brief for him, I'd point out that the, the false accusation made in 1984 doesn't suddenly become true in 2014. No, of, of course, of course it doesn't. But it's a very serious not taking any action over, isn't it? Well, I mean, I, well, we're all missing the same point, or we're all seeing it a little bit more clearly than others. I, I, I honestly don't know which. I really don't. But I'm, I'm even more. Even more unclear now on what exactly it is Tom Watson is supposed to apologise for. Abusing his parliamentary position is the phrase that they are using to describe him. Abusing his parliamentary position by pressing prosecutors to reopen the inquiry in 2014. It had been dropped by police the year before. Which leaves you with one very simple question. Knowing what you know about Tom Watson, do you think he would have acted differently if he was dealing with a politician from a different background or a different party? I don't, but I absolutely respect your right to answer that question saying yes. If it had been a Labour cabinet minister, he wouldn't have done this. I don't believe that to be true, and I don't see what he's supposed to say sorry for.